This sermon is titled How to Receive What God Has Provided Part 2 Be enriched as you listen How to receive what God has provided So I'm going to review uh, very quickly what we did last Sunday Then we're going to go further uh, in that study today And then we will conclude this study next Sunday How to receive what God has provided Now This message applies to anything that you and I want to receive from God, what God has provided. So the the truth that we are discovering, or we will be discovering today and next Sunday from the Word of God, applies to any area. That means uh, whether it's healing, uh, some of us may need healing in our bodies, whether it has to do with finances, or whether it has to do with your family, or it has to do with any other area where God says, look, this is my promise. I've already provided this for you. It applies to all these areas, these same principles. You know, in, uh, if you are in, in, in the corporate setting, we say it applies across the board, meaning it applies to all areas, these same principles. It applies across the board uh, to uh, whatever area of life that you may be considering and saying, God, uh, whatever you promised or whatever you provided, I want to receive it. So uh, pay attention to this. And there may be times in life when you and I need to believe God for, you know, maybe for our healing. There may be other times we need to believe God for finances or maybe believe God for family or uh, the salvation of our loved ones or things, different areas. But these truths apply. You apply, you walk in the same truths in every area of life. So let's quickly review what we began uh, by we began this message by saying that God has already made full provision. You know, Jesus paid it all on the cross. And he's not going to do it again. He's he's done it once for all. It's like uh, the illustration we used last Sunday. Uh, If I went to the store and bought a jacket, uh, you pay for it only once. You pay for the jacket, and then I want to give it to a friend. I want to give it as a gift to the friend. So when I go and give it as a gift to my friend, my friend does not need to go to the store and make a payment. It's been paid. It's done. And so Jesus paid it all. He already made the provision. The only thing that's left for us as believers in Jesus Christ is to learn how to receive that. And we find, we, you know, we reference several scriptures on this. I'm not going to necessarily review all the scriptures. But the Bible says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And that we saw this in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. He's, he has blessed us. That means he's already made the provision. Now, of course, it tells us in the heavenly realms, meaning it has to do in the spiritual So in the spiritual realm, as far as God is concerned, he's already given it to you. Every blessing that he has, he's already put your name on it. So, you know, you and I are not trying to convince God to give it to us. He's already given it. He's got, he's put your name on it already. He says, this is for you. But it's in the spiritual realm. It's been given to you. So what we are learning to do is to receive what God has already given to us in the spiritual realm, to bring it into the natural realm, the realm in which we live, in which we operate. We need to learn how to do that. And then we begin to do that in different areas of our lives. We understand what God has already provided, and then we receive into, we bring into the natural realm what has already been placed to our credit, so to speak, in the spiritual realm. So it's already been provided. Healing is already been provided. And so we pointed out last Sunday the tense of the word of God, that God's word is in the past tense. You know, by whose stripes you were healed. God's saying, I've done the job for you. It's done. Healing is yours. You were healed. It's done. So we are learning how to receive in the natural what God has already provided. 
So along those lines, we uh, mentioned a few statements. We said that uh, God provided it so that we can receive it. The reason he provided it is because he wants us to have it. He's not playing you know, games with us. No, he said, look, I provided it. I want you to have it. Uh, we also said that we've been qualified to enjoy our inheritance. We are not, you know, we don't need to, you know, try to prove ourselves. He qualified us to enjoy it. He says, you're ready to receive your inheritance. Uh, we talked about grace provision versus work rewards. That means everything Jesus provided through the cross has been provided by grace. It's not something we can earn, you know, we can only receive because it's been given to us by grace. And so we need to renew our thinking, change our thinking, and don't try to earn something that God has given by grace. You can never do it. And he's not going to respond to an attempt to earn or merit it. He only responds to faith that says, I receive what you've given to me by grace. We also spoke about faith and responsibility. That is, uh, we have to fulfill our responsibility on earth and we can't, you know, uh, abdicate our responsibility, so to speak, and just try to do things by faith. We balance both. For instance, you know, we, the worship team, were responsible to come and lead worship. They can't sit at home and say, my spirit go and lead worship. No, it's a responsibility. They had to make the effort to come and practice and, you know, do it. Uh, that's responsibility. You have to do it. Uh, so we can't, you know, just uh, say faith will do that. No, you, you've, you've got to do it. You've got to work hard. So that's, that's our responsibility. But then faith helps us fulfill our responsibility as well as go beyond that. Things that we can't do is where God responds to faith and he comes in and does things. So in order to learn how to receive what God has provided, we said, let's look at Abraham. The reason we said we look at Abraham is because God points us to Abraham as the father of faith. And he says, we must walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. And so we have for us in the fourth chapter of Romans, uh, outlined for us very nicely by the Holy Spirit, the steps of the faith of Abraham. And so we are focusing on those five verses and we are uh, drawing from those five verses the steps of the faith of Abraham. Because in Abraham's case, as God does in ours, he says, this is what I want you to have, but by faith, make it yours. And just like Abraham, for us, God has said, I have made these provisions for you. They are yours. By faith, take it, walk in it, receive it. It's there for you. And because he offers it by grace, it's available to everyone who believes. And the, all of us are on level ground when it comes to receiving from God. Whether you're a believer, just you know, a day old, or whether you're a believer who's been 50 years in the faith, we all come to receive by grace through faith. Same. That makes no difference whether you've been a believer for one day or whether you've been a believer for 50 years. Everything God has provided by grace, we all receive the same way through faith. And so we are learning how to do that. So let's pick up from Romans chapter 4. We'll read that passage again today. And of course, we'll read it again tomorrow. And, and so we'll be reading it many, many times again. But it's good to look at this passage, Romans chapter 4 verses 17 through 21, where the steps of the faith of Abraham are outlined for us very nicely by the Holy Spirit here through the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 4, verses 17 to 21. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. 
And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So what we are going to cover in this series, we're going to see seven steps of faith that Abraham took uh, that in his journey of faith to receive what God had said was his. So we looked at the first one. We'll cover uh, the three more today. So the first one, just to quickly review, it's right there in verse 17. It says, he believed God. Abraham believed God. God. That's how it all started. He believed God. Abraham believed God. And we explained that last Sunday, how God wants us to come to this place of believing Him. Now, I want to point out something which I, I did not point out last Sunday. When you look at verse 17, what the Apostle Paul is kind of highlighting is that God spoke to Abraham in the past tense. So in verse 17 of uh, Romans chapter 4, what does God tell Abraham? He says, I have made you a father of many nations. Now if you go back to the Old Testament to find out where this quote or this quotation is taken from, it's in Genesis chapter 17, and I think it's the fourth verse, Genesis 17, verse 4, where, uh, verse 5, Genesis 17, verse 5, where God comes to Abraham, and he's talking to Abraham. And what does he say to Abraham? He says, Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. This is Genesis 17, verse 5. So God is speaking to Abraham in the past tense. I have made you. Now, at that moment, Abraham and Sarah were still childless in Genesis 17. No children. But what is God telling Abraham? Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. Do you have any kids? No. What is God saying? I have made you. He's speaking past tense. And that's what the apostle Paul is highlighting. He's saying, hey, God spoke to Abraham in the past tense. And Abraham was not shocked because Abraham understood something about God. He understood, he believed God, that God gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they did. God is speaking in the past tense. He's calling things that does not exist. Abraham had no, Abraham said, I had no kids. He's calling things that do not exist as though they did. He's saying, I have made you. No children yet. But God says, I've done it. I've done it. Think about this. God is telling you and me, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. He's speaking to you and me just the way he spoke to Abraham. I have made you. You have been healed. Now, at this very moment, maybe in your body, healing is absent. There's probably, maybe there is sickness, there is pain, there's something like that. But God speaks to you in the past tense, exactly the way he spoke to Abraham. I have made you the father of a nation. Because God calls things that do not exist as though they did. Now, believing is coming into agreement with such a God. Believing is coming and saying, yes, God, what you're saying is true. Because you are the God who gives life to the dead. So that's the believing God is calling us to. To come into an agreement with his past tense. He says, I've made you. So what do you and I say? God has made me. But you say, how can you say that when you still are childless? Or when you um, feel pain in your body? How can you say it? Because I know who God is. He's the God who gives life to the dead. And as far as he is concerned, his work is done. The moment he spoke it, it's done. So believing is coming into the agreement with what God has said. When God says, by his stripes you were healed, you believe, God, it's a done thing. You're coming into agreement with the past tense of his word. Now, 
Jesus said it like this, and we, we referenced this last time in Mark eleven twenty four. He said, believe that you have received it and you will have it. So I must believe that I have it. I believe that you have received it. It's already done in the spirit. God gives it to me in the spirit. And in my spirit, I believe it's done. Believe that you have received it. Because faith is the title deed of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. So by faith, I believe I have received it. It's done. Why? Because God said it. And then you will have it. So for example, if you're believing God for your children, maybe at this time, you know, your children may not be walking in the ways of the Lord. Uh, maybe they are you know, they are not walking in the faith. Maybe, uh, you know, they are not, uh, you know, on fire for God and so on and so forth. What do you do? Believe his word. So what can I believe? Well, you take the word of God. He said in Isaiah 44, 3 and 4, he says, I will pour my spirit upon your seed, my blessing on your offspring. He says, your children will be taught by the Lord. Great will be their peace, Isaiah 54, 13. In Isaiah 59, 21, he said, My spirit that's upon you and my word that's in your mouth will pass on to your children and to your children's children. So what do you do? You meditate in it till you come to the place where you say, God, as far as I'm concerned, this is done. Where? In your spirit. You believe it's done. In the natural, it may not appear, but that's okay. God said, Jesus said, Believe that you have received. Your faith says, because God said it, it's done. Believe that you have received. And you will have. That will have will take place in the natural. But it is settled first in your heart. The same thing with healing. You believe it's done. Why? Because God said you were healed. God has spoken. See, God speaks in the past tense. I have made you the father of many nations. I have done it. God is not lying because as far as he's concerned, it's a done thing. And believing is coming into agreement with the past tense of God's word because you know God will never lie. Believe that you have received. To arrive at that place of believing that you have received may take some time. And, it, and you arrive at that place through just meditating in the word. You stay in the word and say, God, because you said it, I believe it. And you arrive at that place where in your heart, it's a settled matter. It's done. You believe that you have received. You know, it's very interesting. And, 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 and I know I'm still on the, on the first point. We have three points to cover today. But... It's very interesting, you know, in, in, in Matthew, the eighth chapter, when the centurion came to Jesus on behalf of his servant who was, you know, uh, in a very bad physical condition. Uh, he must have been paralyzed or I don't, we don't know exactly what the illness was, uh, but he was in a very bad condition. He comes to Jesus and, he, and, and, and you know, Jesus offers to go to his house, goes to his, offers to go to his house and heal him. He says, you don't have to come to my house. You just speak the word and that's it. Just speak the word, it's enough. Just speak the word, it's enough. Just speak the word, it's enough. I'm repeating that again. Just speak the word, it's enough. God, just speak the word, he has already spoken. Just speak the word, he's already spoken. So the centurion told Jesus, Jesus, just speak the word, it's enough. And you know what Jesus told him? This is in uh, Matthew 8, verse 13. He says, as you have believed, let it be done. Look at the past tense. He's telling the centurion, you know, as you've believed. That means, centurion, I know. It's a done thing in your heart. As you have believed, let it be done. He didn't say, as you're trying to believe. Or as you're hoping. See, some people say, I hope to get healed someday. That's not believing. And we will emphasize that, explain that a little later. We have to come to that place where we believe that it's done. 
where we believe that we have received. Or like the centurion, Jesus told him, as you have believed, meaning it's done in your heart, let it be done for you, as you have believed. So the first thing is this, to get ourselves in this place where we believe in God, believe his word, that God, what you have said, Concerning my finances, concerning my life, concerning my life situation, concerning my healing, concerning my family, or whatever you know, you're looking at, it's done for me because of your word. The second step we see in Abraham's uh, journey of faith is that, this is verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So the second step of faith, which we will see, we see in Abraham's life, is against all hope, in hope, he still believed. So you and I, we must believe God, even if it is hopeless. Against all hope, in hope, he believed. So let's Explain that a bit. First of all, against all hope. That means it was a hopeless situation uh, that Abraham was in. Uh, Abraham and Sarah. It was hopeless. I mean, there's no reason for them to even have hope. That word hope can be also translated desire or expectation. That means there was not even the slightest reason for them to expect anything to happen. Zero reason for any kind of expectation or any kind of desire. I mean, just forget it kind of situation. Against this, what did Abraham do? In hope, he believed. I want to emphasize that. In hope, he believed. So there are two things here we see. We see hope and we see believing. And remember, the word believe or faith, they are interchangeable. So in hope, he believed. Hope is very important. Hope is that expectation. It's that desire. You see, usually, when people give up hope, when they give up on their expectation or desire, it's the end of the story. As long as they are able, we are able to sustain that hope, that desire, that expectation, then Faith can come in. In hope, he believed. Hope is the, the pace setter. It's like what will draw faith out of you. But you've got to have hope first. So hope is an expectation. It's a desire. And then in hope, what happened? He believed. That means faith began to come out of him. So hope is important, but hope is different from faith. Hope says, I can see it with my mind's eye. I can envision it. I can expect it. I can desire it. You're able to paint a mental picture of a desired outcome. Hope. It's important. You need to be able to have that, that expectation. So, example, if you're sick, See yourself well. See yourself strong. If the doctors have given you, you know, saying six more months to live, expect to live another 10 years or 20 years or whatever uh, the length of life. Go beyond that. Have hope, have expectation, have desire. And in hope, the next thing is in hope, believed. That means faith kicked in. Remember what we read in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is an expectation. Faith gives substance to it. Faith comes in and says, I now have that expectation. It brings into possession what you expect or desire or hope for. So hope is important, but you don't stop with hope. Faith's got to come in. That believing has to come in. In hope, you believe. I hope this has come through clearly to you. 
The problem with many of us is we stop with hope. We think hope is faith, but hope is not faith. Hope will draw faith out of you. But many of us just stop with this hope or with this expectation. Oh God, it will be nice if I can be healed. It will be nice sometime in the future, in the sweet by and by or whatever, you know, I'll get healed. That expectation is good, but it's got to bring the believing out of you and me. So in a hope, Abraham believed. In the second point, the truth we want to emphasize is against all hope, who contrary to hope, in hope he still believed. That means when there was no reason to have hope, he still had hope and went on to believe. And that's what I want to emphasize. That even when there is no reason to have any hope, you choose to have hope and you go on to believing God. When there is no reason for hope, still believe God. And you know, this is something Jesus taught. And I'll just reference quickly two incidents in the ministry of Jesus. You remember Jairus in Mark chapter 5. He came to Jesus and he said, Lord, you know, my daughter is at the point of death. Please come home. Lay your hand on her. I know she'll be healed. So Jesus starts making his way to the home of Jairus. And on the way, he's held up because there's a, another woman. There's a woman with, a, with an issue of blood. She comes and touches Jesus. And so Jesus is ministering to her. And by the time he takes care of that situation, news comes from Jairus' home saying, Don't trouble the master. Your daughter is dead. In other words, they are saying, See, there was hope because she was alive. But now there is no hope. She's dead. How did Jesus respond when a situation went from bad to worse? What was his response? In Mark chapter 5 and in verse 36, Jesus told Jairus, Do not be afraid, only believe. This is Jesus talking. If Jesus was standing next to you, and you received news that a certain situation in your life went from bad to worse, what would Jesus say? He would say exactly these words. He would say, fear not, only believe. He would not say anything different. Or think about the time with Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus arrives, but he comes four days late. And uh, Mary and Martha, of course, are grieving. And uh, uh, Jesus comes there and he says, move the stone away. And Martha immediately is taken aback. And he says, Lord, he's dead. He's been dead four days. I mean, if you had come earlier, maybe he would not have died. But now things are really beyond redemption. Things are really beyond any hope. Nothing can be done right now. How did Jesus respond? He said, Martha, this is John 11 verse 40. Martha, didn't I tell you, if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. If Jesus was standing next to you in a life situation, where things have reached a point where there is no possible solution, what would he tell you? He would tell you exactly what he told Martha. He would say, if you believe, you can see the glory of God. Now, you know, as a minister of God, and many of our pastors also would attest to this, that sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations. That means somebody comes to you with a situation where it is hopeless. Absolutely. I mean, there's just no reason for hope. And for me, I struggle. You know, what do I tell them? And I have decided 
that I will follow the example of Jesus. I know I may be criticized for doing that. Because people say you're giving them a false hope. You're giving them, uh, you're unnecessarily creating hope when you shouldn't be doing that. Well, it's okay if I'm accused with Jesus the same way. Fine. It's good company. What did Jesus do? To Jairus he said, fear not, only believe. To Mary and Martha he said, if you believe, you will see the glory of of God. And so this is what we take away from Abraham, verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed. So second step that you and I must maintain if we want to receive what God has provided. Even when there is no hope, believe God. Have hope and in hope believe. Don't give up. Because if God has spoken, He's the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence what does not exist. He can bring it in there. So even when there is no hope, believe God. The next step, step number three, we see in Abraham's example is this. And this is in verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So here's number three. He was not weak in faith and did not look at the circumstances. Or we could put it this way. Do not let circumstances dictate your faith. That's verse 19. Do not let circumstances dictate your faith. So Abraham realized, hey, I'm old. Sarah is old and barren. I mean, this is reality. This is fact. But yet, I'm going to believe. I will not let the facts, the circumstances dictate my faith. Because faith is in God. It is based on what He has spoken. And God has said I have made you the father of many nations. So Abraham had a choice. On the one hand, there are facts. We are not denying the facts. But on the other hand, there is what God has spoken. What God has already provided or said about me. I have a choice. What am I going to believe? And it tells us in verse 19... He didn't let the facts dictate his faith. He chose to believe what God had spoken. So that's the third step in our journey of faith. You know, we will be confronted with this reality of the situation. Now, we are not in denial. We recognize the situation, and there may be some things in the natural which we have to do to address the matter, and we will do it. We are responsible people. And we will address the matter in the natural that need to be addressed. Do what, what, is, what you need to do. But you do not let the circumstances, situations dictate your faith or determine your faith. Your faith is determined by what God has spoken. You go back to his word. So maybe it's a fact that your body is sick and there's sickness there. Yes, you're not denying it. You don't say, I'm not sick. No, there, there is sickness, there's pain, there's hurt, there's whatever. But God said, God has said something. That by his stripes, I have been healed. So, it's really interesting when you look at Abraham's journey. There was a time Abraham was discouraged. And this is in Genesis 15. So, it's almost about 15 years or so after he began his journey of faith. So you know, he began his journey of faith in Genesis, the 12th chapter. Here we are in chapter 15, and Abraham is having a conversation with God. He says, God, uh, nothing's happening. No child yet. 
So I want to clarify with you, did you mean exactly that Sarah and I will have a child? Or did you mean any child born in my household? Clarifying with God. It's really, you know, he's doubting because God, time's gone by 15 years or so. No child. Just like us. Time's gone and, and you're wondering what's happening. And at that moment, what does God do? He says, Abraham, come out of your tent. So it must have been midnight, clear Middle Eastern sky. And God says, Abraham, look up into the sky. And he looks up and he sees stars, numerous stars. And God says, Abraham, I'm telling you, that's how many descendants you and Sarah are going to have. In other words, God is saying, he's painting a fresh picture. And you can imagine Abraham must have taken a snapshot of that, that night sky. And from that moment on, in his mind's eye, he would see these night stars. And there would be a reminder to him, God said, that's how many descendants will come from Sarah and me. God painted a fresh picture of his promise. And so the point I want to make is this. Instead of focusing on the facts, paint in your mind a fulfillment of the promise of God. Just like what he did for Abraham. He painted a picture. And there was another time he said, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Another picture. Of a fulfillment of the promise of God. So you paint a picture in your mind. Of the fulfillment of what God has provided for you. You see yourself walking in it. You see yourself experiencing in the natural. The fulfillment of what God has provided for you. That's what he encouraged Abraham to do. And so. In order to stay strong in faith. And not let the facts determine your faith, but rather the word of God determine our faith. One of the things we can do is to paint in our mind's eye on the canvas of our imagination a fulfillment of what God has provided. See yourself walking in it. See yourself healed. See yourself blessed. See yourself financially prosperous. See your family having peace and joy. See your children walking with God and serving God. See in your mind's eye Paint on the canvas of your imagination a fulfillment of what God says he has provided for you. Just like Abraham. From that moment on, he could see the night sky with the stars. And they always told him, Abraham, this is what God said is yours. He has made you the father of such a nation. So pay attention to God's word in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. God says, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So God says, just pay attention to my word. Pay attention to my word. So rather than focusing on the facts, turn your attention to the word. You're not denying the facts. You're just choosing to focus your attention on a higher reality, which is the word of God. You're not denying it. You're living in the truth of the word of God. So lean over to God's word and pay attention to it. You know, another simple thing God taught Abraham, this is in chapter 17, is he comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, change your speaking. Instead of calling yourself Abram, call yourself Abraham. And so calling your wife Sarai, call her Sarah. So he changed their speaking, aligned their speaking to the word that he had given to them. Abraham means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Sarai means princely. Sarah means mother of princess, meaning many princes. So he says, change your speaking. 
begin to call yourself what I have declared you to be. And so you can imagine from that day in Genesis 17, Abraham announces, you know, he gets all his people together and he says, guys, we're having a name changing ceremony. And so they're all wondering, you know, whoa, here's the old man. What's he going to call himself now? And he says, from today, my name has been changed from Abraham to Abraham. I'm going from just being an exalted father to being the father of a nation, of a multitude. And my wife's name, Sarai, is changed to Sarah. She's a mother of many, many princesses. Many kings, rulers are coming out of her. And everybody says, well, we dare not question this old man. But from today, we call him Abraham. And we call his wife Sarah. And Abraham calls himself that. And you can imagine Abraham shouting across you know, the tents, Sarah, mother of many kings, many rulers, many princes, come forth. So they're attesting with their mouth as truth what God has declared in his word. So that's what we must learn to do. Speak faith. Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. You begin to speak the word of God over your own life and your family. And just one more thought here. One more step. Step number four. He, uh, this is in verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. You know, maybe I'll just pause here. We will pick this up next Sunday. We will pick up from uh, this step uh, and, and, and move forward with this. All right? But I want you to get these three things. What do we see Abraham do? First, he believed God. Worship team, let's come. Come up, please. Abraham believed God. He believed God. He believed the past tense of God's word. He believed that when God said it's done, it's done. So he settled it in his heart even before he could experience it in the natural. So that's the first thing for us. Believe that when God said he's provided it, it's done. No questions. Second, Abraham, what did Abraham do? When there was no hope, he still believed in hope or in hope he believed. He kept his hope up and he kept his believing up, even when there was no reason for hope. So that's the second step. Believe God even when things seem hopeless. And the third step of faith we see Abraham is Abraham take our journey through is he did not let the circumstances dictate his faith but instead he let God and his word determine his faith and in order to do that God taught him two practical things one see in your mind's eye the fulfillment of my promise speak with the words of your mouth the fulfillment of my promise so both your imagination and your speaking changes to align itself with what God has provided. So in your mind, rather than thinking about the facts and about the problem, you look at the fulfillment of the promise. God said it, I'm seeing that. And you begin to declare over your own life that what God said is true. Now, you don't have to go and do it out in public. Some people may not understand. You know, Jesus made this simple statement. He said, don't cast your pearls before swine. That means, you know, if you've got something of great value, don't go and throw it out before people who don't understand it. I mean, don't, 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 don't do that. So when I say, when we say, speak God's word over your own life, be wise about it. You know, don't go and just blabble or, you know, just speak in front of people who don't understand what you're saying. I mean, why cast your pearls? But in your closet, in your time of prayer, in the presence of God, just by yourself, you speak over your own life and say, this is what God has spoken over my life. So we have four more steps to cover. We'll do that next Sunday in Abraham's journey of faith. 
And I want to invite you, just as God tells us, we must walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Learn how to exercise your faith in God. We are learning the steps of faith. How to exercise faith. So today, we're going to worship God for a few moments. The worship, the worship team will help us. And I want you to apply these three steps of faith in your life. First, come into agreement with God. The past tense of what God said. If God said it's done, it's done. Come into agreement with that. Settle it in your heart. And say, God, I agree with you. If you said you have made me, then I agree it's done. Secondly, even if there is no reason for hope, in hope, believe. Keep your hope up, which is your expectation or desire. And then believe. In hope, believe. Have faith. And the third step, don't let your circumstances dictate your faith. There are facts, but there is the promise, the word of God, the truth of God. And the word of God is superior to the facts. The circumstances can change. The word of God is eternal. It will never change. So you choose to put your eyes on the word. On the canvas of your imagination, paint a picture of what God has said. And let your words begin to speak what God has said. Speak that over your own life. Maybe your body, maybe your mind, maybe your family, maybe your finances, maybe your family, your children, whatever. Speak the word of God. Just between you and God, it's an expression of your faith. Like what Abraham did, you and I will do. Take a few moments, please, just to worship God as the worship team leads us. I believe Oh, I receive already spoken God and I believe I choose to I hope and I go beyond and I choose to believe what you've spoken well I see I see the reality God but I choose to believe I choose to believe in what you've spoken, God, because you are who you say you are. And you said you are a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently seek you. So I believe, and so we believe. Yes, Lord. And we speak as we have believed. We choose to speak. We confess, we declare as we have believed even now. I, I believe in Jesus. I believe He is the Son of God. sing and declare that again. I believe in Jesus. Oh, and I, I believe in Jesus. Now I believe He is the Son of God. I believe He died and rose again.
Amen, amen. Right where you are, I want you to believe God. For whatever your life situation is, different ones of us will be going through different things in life, challenges in life. If everything is perfect in your life, thank God for it and pray for somebody who needs your prayer. But for most of us, for most of us, there's something that we want to see happen. Maybe a financial situation. God has already spoken. What has He said? My God will supply for all your needs according to His riches and glory through Christ. He has already spoken. He said, God will make all grace abound to a Jew. That you always having all sufficiency in all things will abound to every good work. He's already spoken. So he's already given you his word. Maybe it's a family. He's already given you his word. He said the house of the righteous will stand. He said he blesses the house of the righteous. He said there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation in the house of the righteous. He's already given you his word. It could be some other situation, maybe health and healing in your body and mind. He's already given you his word. He says, by the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. You were healed. He says, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. He's promised. He said, that's it. I've already given you my word. Long life. Now, three things. First, settle it in your heart. You come into agreement with what God has spoken. Believe. God, it's a settled thing. I receive it. I'm not hoping to get it sometime in the future. I 
Receive it now. It's mine. It's settled between God and me. Second, even if it's hopeless, you still have hope. And in hope, you believe. What can we do? On the canvas of our imagination, we can paint a fulfillment of that word. See that word happening in your life. See your family happy. See what rejoicing in your family. See you, your, your spouse and your children being happy. You can paint that on the canvas of your imagination. See your children serving God. Paint that on the canvas of your imagination. See yourself prosperous financially or professionally or whatever. Paint that on the canvas of your imagination. That's what God told Abraham to do or he did for Abraham. And secondly, speak it over your life like God told Abraham and Sarah. Call yourself according to the word. You say, God, in my home, there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. My house of the righteous will stand. My children, Lord, they receive the revelation, the anointing that's on my life passes on to my children and to my children's children, God. Or Lord, my finances are blessed, oh God. Speak it. Three simple steps of faith we have learned so far. Apply it in your life. And Father, as people who are hearing the word, as they act in obedience to your word, oh God, Thank you, you said you will watch over your word to perform it. Thank you, you said your word will not return to you void, but it will prosper. As people everywhere believe, against all hope, in hope, believe. And they do not consider the circumstances, but they choose to believe your word. Thank you for being faithful to fulfill your word in their lives and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I command healing I break the yoke of sickness and disease by the authority of Jesus name and by the power of the Holy Spirit every affliction every disease every infirmity every spirit of infirmity leave and let there be healing coming in right now like incurable diseases be healed right now. And in the name of Jesus and by the authority of God's Holy Spirit, by the anointing of God's Holy Spirit, we speak blessing financially in the households, in the family. We speak salvation and deliverance of our family members in the name of Jesus. Let it be. Father, thank you for doing it. In the lives of your people. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for testimonies. Thank you for deliverances. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to write to us at testimony at apcw.org. Tell us how these services are ministering to you, strengthening you. Uh, it'll be a great way for us to interact and to know what God is doing in your lives uh, as you connect with us. And uh, we'll be delighted to hear from you. We will close. We're going to continue this next Sunday. Please share this message with other people so that they can be encouraged in their faith. And you know, hopefully we'll wrap this up next Sunday. And in case we don't, we'll just continue it for the following Sunday. But uh, we want to learn how to receive what God has provided. So stay with us next Sunday. Let's receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit empower and abide with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. See you again. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. 
For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.